Thank you, Arendt. It feels more natural. Um, thank you very much. It is a great honor for me to be a board member of the Foundation. I can tell you when I was asked, I guess I considered for about two seconds before my decision. Because Arendt Elistan was a, a great inspiration for me as a young, young uh, man uh, when he did what he did in September 1973 in Chile. That was something marvelous. And I believe that we should live up to his legacy. And so it's a great honor for me to be in the foundation, an honor to be right here to talk. And I would like to start off by saying that I'm honored to talk at the same event as Chilean Body. I deeply respect your work for human rights. Uh, I want you to know that I look forward to see if you also can help us with uh, making sure that Sweden can be even stronger in these kind of issues. Sweden's position as a defender for human rights and uh, all over the globe. So I'm, I'm very honored to be at the same event as you. Ladies and gentlemen, Sophie Scholl was executed on the 22nd of February 1943 at the age of 21. She had spoken out against the Nazi regime in Germany and was therefore sentenced to death for high treason. During her last hours, she said to her cellmate, and I quote, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone who will give their life for a righteous cause, end of quote. Now, the actions of Sophie Scholl her brother Hans Scholl and the other members of the group called the White Rose is outstanding example of civil courage. They decided to act in accordance with their beliefs and tried to expose the Nazi regime by spreading leaflets at the University of Munich where they all were studying. The leaflets told the truth about Nazi crime in Poland and Germans, the German army's recent losses uh, on the Eastern Front. They knew that Nazis' control was absolute in the police, in the court, in all parts of society. They knew that the Gestapo had informers and collaborators everywhere. They knew that they themselves were not in danger in danger as long as they kept quiet, but that speaking out was punishable by death. Yet, still they acted. Many scholars have studied why Sophie Scholl had the courage to do what she did in a time when very few dared to speak up against the regime, even in the privacy of their own homes. While no one will be able to point out one single factor, her education and learning seem to be a foundation for her activism. She loved literature and art and enrolled at the University of Munich to study biology and philosophy. She seemed to have had a genuine passion for indulging in knowledge, very much like Harald Edelstein who was top of his class during his studies. That quest for learning, often described by the German word Bildung, is a thirst not necessarily for knowledge used in a profession, but for life in general. Knowing not only what you feel is right, but also that you have a moral duty to act upon it, is a crucial prerequisite for civil courage. And that knowledge can only be formed by thinking about those issues, reading about them, and forcing yourself to reflect upon them, as Sophie Scholl did. Sophie and her friends in the White Rose studied philosophy from antiquity and onward. They discussed questions of human rights and the individual's responsibility under a dictatorship, and they made a very brave decision to act. And this is a lesson for us today. 
It is true that the idea of fundamental rights for every individual has its roots in cultures from all over the globe. Traces of the rights presented in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948 could be found in ancient cultures in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, and as well as here in Europe. But knowing how to treat your fellow human being is not something that you're born with. It's not something that's in your blood. It has to be learned and it has to be remembered <coughs> by every generation. That's why it's important that the, aid, the aim of education system is not only to prepare you for a trade or a profession, but also to prepare you for life. And that is why I believe in making further education more accessible so that everyone can have the opportunity to take part in higher learning. And that's why we try to supplement our children's education with projects concerning human rights, such as the Living History Forum, created to teach all young Swedes about previous crime against humanity and the value of democracy. A constantly ongoing discussion on every individual's inviolable rights is a vaccine against totalitarian regimes. And I'm glad to see that Harald Edestam Foundation is becoming a stronger and stronger voice in this discussion because even though that discussion is not a guarantee, it is indeed a good safeguard for the democracy and human rights. And knowing that this form of learning provides a foundation for civil courage gives me hope for the future. It is now becoming easier to spread and access information with every passing day. Many universities publish their courses on, on, online for the general public, and knowledge and awareness of human rights is becoming harder to contain, harder to suppress. That was also due, shown during the recent Arab Spring, where many young and educated men and women organized and spread demands for democracy. And we can also see during the recent protests in Russia that the arrested members of the now world famous group Pussy Riot were students of journalism and philosophy. This can also be seen in China, where young people return from studying abroad with knowledge of the possibilities of a more open society and the will to speak up for it. Their education becomes a foundation and maybe a spark for their civil courage, just as it did for Sophie Scholl, just as it did for Harald Edestam. One of the ancient Greek philosophers that Sophie Scholl studied was probably Epictetus, and he once said, only the educated are free. I don't think that should be interpreted that only those with degrees or diplomas could be independent individuals, but more that it takes learning to fully understand what it means to be a human. Sophie Scholl, she knew this. She acted upon it and stood up for human rights even though she was surrounded by a totalitarian regime. The paper on which the death sentence was presented to her was saved in the Nazi archives and found later. On the back of it, there is a single handwritten word. It says freedom. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, I'm really glad that you made it to um, our lecture today. In today's modern world, which in many ways is supposed to be developed and modern, however, many people still struggle with restrained circumstances, and therefore it is important to encourage acts that emphasizes moral and civic courage. The world needs role models. My grandfather was a man with a great pathos for justice. It requires courage to intervene oneself when you see a fellow human being in need and deprived of their human rights. Action in the field of hostile environments is a privilege of few because exceptional courage is required. In extreme situations of widespread human suffering and persecution, persecution, those who are willing to risk themselves on behalf of others, not only to save lives, but most important, preserve for all of us the essential value of human dignity. <coughs> indispensable for our lives being worth living. My, great, my grandfather is one of those few exceptions. In every situation in which he was confronted, he had the option of using his diplomatic immunity for saving himself or the choice of acting to protect others in imminent danger. He decided to act Whatever the price, his generosity left us a legacy of coherence and responsibility. A reference for our collective duty to act in protection of def uh, defenseless people who are the victims of serious abuses. During the later part of the Second World War, he worked as a young diplomat in the Nazi-occupied Norway. He functioned as a link between the Germans and the Norwegian resistance movement, called the Hemmerfonten, who came to call him the Black Pimpernel. He was very active in the smuggling of threatened Norwegian resistance fighters and Jews to Sweden, people whom he was protecting in his own private home, which he frequently used to hide and protect hundreds uh, and hunted resistant men and others. At one point he had 12 men in his basement and at the same time he had dinner with some of the highest German officers in his dining room. The greatest achievements were, however, in the secret information work through an illegal newspaper as a diplomat, he had access to ink, uh, to paper, he had access to radio, which he could listen to the broadcasts from London. And by secret means, he managed to acquire printing presses and the printing paper. And after the radio broadcasts, he authored the newsletters that became a very important source of information and a counterweight for the German uh, control Nazi propaganda. In, in 1972, my grandfather became the ambassador uh, to Santiago de Chile. And his mission was first and foremost to transmit Swedish assistance to the government coalition, Unidad Popular in Chile. The assistance ceased at the time of Augusto Pinochet's military coup on the 11th of September in 1973. He had, from the start, openly uh, expressed his sympathies for the government and for the socialist, the, the demo, democratic elected president, uh, Salvador Allende. And, um, However, he was then, uh, Allende was then overthrown uh, by the dictator Pinochet, who was, were seeking protection uh, at the Swedish embassy. 
Let us then save countless of people by, among other things, offering persecuted Chileans and other Latin Americans who had fled to Chile from military dictatorships in Uruguay and Brazil, save Canada too and asylum in Sweden. He used his diplomatic immunity. And at one point, he was going in, he was standing in front of the Cuban embassy and the junta were shooting at the building. And he was standing in the, in the rain of bullets and he was saying, stop shooting, the, the ground I'm standing on is Swedish, Swedish territory. If you continue shooting, you will declare uh, open war against Sweden. Uh, the junta were a bit surprised by the whole event, so what they happened was that they stopped shooting and thereby he managed to save the whole um, Cuban staff of the embassy. And also the day after he came back and he hailed the Swedish flag at the Cuban embassy and thereby declared it as Swedish territory. Uh, which now could welcome much more Chileans and other people who were seeking protection. The military regime did not appreciate my grandfather's engagement and in December 1973 he was expelled from Chile by the coup generals and declared persona non grata. This was the result of a fight with the generals at a hospital in Santiago <coughs> trying to, to get the Uruguayan lady the chance to get a crucial surgery. But before that he reached to give protection to more than 1,500 people in Santiago. And he saved them from death, prison and torture. The Edelstein Prize is awarded for outstanding contributions and exceptional courage in standing up for one's beliefs in the defense of human rights. The international jury is chaired by myself and then we have very prominent people on the jury, such as uh, Dr. Shirin Nevali herself, representing Asia. We have Justice Luisa Wu, former High Commissioner of the United Nations, representing North America. We have uh, former President Pascal Mokumbi, representing Africa. And uh, we have uh, Philip Olson, who is United Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary and arbitrary, arbitrary Executions, who represent Oceania. And we have Latin America, which is re represented by Chile's former president, Mr. Ricardo Lagos. And Europe is represented by the judge Baltasar Garzón who served on Spain's Central Criminal Court and who is consistently fighting for human rights. Baltasar Garzón is most famous for indicting, in, indicting the Chilean president, um, General Pinochet, for the alleged death and torture of Spanish citizens. The winner of the Edelstein Prize can be a private person or a person who serves in a government, international or in a national organization. The winner should be an individual who has acted in Ambassador Harald Edelstam's spirit in a country or in countries where human rights, according to international law, have been violated. The laureate must have shown outstanding capabilities in analyzing and handling complex situations and in finding ways, even unconventional ones, and creative ones, <coughs> to defend human rights. The candidate has presumably, in a very complex situation, been able to take a decisive role in helping threaten people or direct, directly saving human lives. Civic courage is a central parameter in the selection of a successful candidate for the Edelstein Prize. The Edelstein Prize 2012 was awarded to Ms. Bahare Hedayat, who dared to play a leading role in the students' movement as in the women's rights movement in Iran. And she has been an active critic of Iran's regime 
and President Amadina. She has faced severe police brutality and has been arrested several times for her courageous actions. And she is today a political prisoner in the horrible prison in Evin prison in Tehran, in Iran. What happened afterward, after she was um, awarded with the Amnesty Prize, was that the Amnesty International listed her as a prisoner, um, listed her uh, as um, sorry. They listed her as a prisoner of conscience. And they have been uh, doing campaigns all over the world internationally to give her support. And I just <coughs> learned the other day when I been in contact with her family in Iran that she has been given medical care and she has also been on uh, permission from the, from the prison um, over the Iranian New Year. And this makes me feel very happy, as then I see our work actually contribute to support a person who is getting some international support. The Edelstein Prize has an open nomination process. That is to say that anyone can nominate a candidate through our webpage, edelsteinprize.org. The last days the last day to submit nominations is the last uh, <coughs> day of October. By now, opening the Edelstein Prize call for nominations, I ask you all to show your support by nominating courageous persons. Why is that? The international community learned many lessons during the first half of the 20th century. After the terrible first war, the slogan was, no more war, but only 20 years later, an even more terrible war was initiated by Hitler. After the disastrous Second World War, the United Nations <coughs> were created with a mission to protect peace and promote development in the world. History since has shown that these tasks are very difficult and that common efforts have not always been successful. But already in 1948, the General Assembly of the United Nations took one of its most important decisions so far. <coughs> With a very impressive majority, the General Assembly agreed on the Declaration of Human Rights a few nations, not surprisingly the dictatorships, abstain, abstain from supporting the declaration. But the document as such is a milestone in the development of human civilization. The United, declaration, United Nations Declaration has been followed by other important documents and decisions, such as European Court of Human Rights, and the fight for human rights is going on at several levels, including civil society organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. Ladies and gentlemen, the defense of human rights is definitely on the international agenda. And most governments and politica, uh, politician, politicians at least pay lip service for the human rights. However, we all know that the reality on the ground is terrible in many places of the world. We know that many countries have a very long way to go before democracy in the real sense of the word has been established. We know that human rights are violated every day, every hour, every minute. The most important is to encourage those few people around the world who have the courage to protest and to stand up against violence and persecution. And this we do through education. Education about what is right and what is wrong. 
Today, when you enter the theater, you have the opportunity to take part of the exhibition The Human Rights Family, painted by the artist Mr. Carl Adam Kronstedt, based on Dr. Professor Hans Ingvar Ruth's idea of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The idea discusses how some rights are absolute and basic, such as the right not to be tortured and not to live under slavery, which are therefore considered to be seen as the parents within the family. The fight for one right seldom occurs alone, but more often in a context when fighting for the other human rights. The family metaphor connotes to a mutual inter interdependency and a constant interaction, which can create criteria on how the individual right, how the individual rights should be interpreted and implemented in relation to each other. Some rights can, as I said, be seen as parents in the family through their absolute and basic character. However, the majority of the rights should instead be considered as equal siblings, which in different ways strengthen each other's character and, and uh, position. Some of the siblings in the family differ, as one, some of them are based on. Food and water are also crucial in order to survive. And they could be considered to be the parents' eldest children. The teaching of human rights consists not only of the learning of principles, but also the practical wisdom. The ability to conform the principles with a sensitivity for the concrete circumstances without a self-interest. The exhibition will be touring around the world to controversial sites for the coming four years and each article in the exhibition will be linked to a specific hero. Concrete examples of heroes, that is what inspires us to show civic courage. That is, what, that is what we want to accomplish with supporting courageous people. And we are very honored to have the opportunity to do that together with Dr. Ebadi. And she's actually one of my own personal heroes, as she has shown a great bravery in believing in our idealistic vis uh, vision in creating the first international prize for civic courage in the world. Dr. Ebadi was the first member to accept uh, a membership on the Edelstein Prize jury, which was very brave when I sent her an email from my hotmail uh, address. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ebadi, and please welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to be among you and to address you at this event. And I would like to first of all thank the organizers and also thank you for having come to listen to me. مردی رو که اهمیت میداد به انسانیت و به حقوق بشر 
یعنی آقای الیسون We have gathered here to honor the memory of a human being, a man who respected human rights and human beings. That is Mr. Edelstein. و به یاد این مرد بزرگ هم دو سال یک جایزه ای یکی از شجاعترین افراد در زمینه پیشورد حقوق بشر تقدیم میشه. And every two years, the Edelson Foundation presents an award to, uh, in the name of this great man, Mr. Edelson, to a courageous person who tries to try and promote human rights. But how do you say that in 2012, one of the most important things of the Iranian And as it was mentioned earlier, in 2012, the prize was awarded to one of my compatriots. Bahari Hedayat, daughter of Javanis, who was a member of the Jewish community and was awarded the prize in 2012. Bahari Hedayat, who was awarded the prize, is a young student who was uh, representing students, and she was, because of her activity, sentenced to nine years in prison. And she's already spent two years of that sentence in prison. During the Iranian New Year period, which started on 21st of March, Bahari Hedayat was given a few days leave, prison furlough, to go and visit her family, and then she returned to prison. And I am certain that had it not been for the international spotlight that this prize had given to the case of Bahara Hedaya, she wouldn't have even been given those few days to go and visit her family. Therefore, I feel it my duty to thank the Edelson Foundation for having And I hope that the day will come that the situation in Iran will be such that people will be allowed to speak freely instead of being imprisoned for nine years Merely for making a speech. Bahari Hedayat, نماینده دانشجویانی بود که به حکومت اعتراض دارد. Bahari Hedayat was the representative of students who were objecting to the conduct of the government. و متأسفانه در حال حاضر حدود صد دانشجو ما در زندان داریم. And sadly. At present, we have some hundred students in prison. And I very much hope that this prize will shine the international spotlight on the entire student body in Iran so that the world comes to know what the Iranian youth are suffering. Now the important question is what is the difference, what's the dispute between the Iranian people and the government? What are the people in Iran protesting against? One of the issues is that the 
حکومت ایران در زمینه انرژی هسته ای مخالفت میکنند. One of the grievances of the Iranian people is that they object to the Iranian government's nuclear policy. اصرار ایران بر ادامه قنیسازی اورانیوم و بی توجهی به مسببات شورای امنیت سازمان ملل متحد باعث شده که ایران با تحریم های سنگینی مواجه بشه. Iran's insistence to continue enriching uranium uh, has uh, um, exacerbated its situation, has led to countless resolutions by the United Nations Security Council and has faced the Ira Iranian people with sanctions. The economic sanctions imposed on Iran have increased poverty in the country, but the government is even abusing these sanctions uh, to their own end and has actually managed to earn money out of abusing these sanctions. خدمش حکومت در این زمینه مخالفند که معتقدند انرژی هسته ای حتی برای مسائل سرخامیز برای زیست محیطی این خوب است. The Iranian people are against the policies of Iran on the issue of the nuclear energy because they believe that even for peaceful purposes there is no need for nuclear energy in Iran. همون طور که میدونید تعدادی از کشورها از جمله آلمان و آفریقای جنوبی نیروگاه‌های برق هسته‌ایشون رو تعطیل کردند برای که برای زیست محیطی مناسب است. As you know several countries such as Germany and South Africa have shut down their nuclear power plants because they're not good for the environment. و سوی گذشته ایران روی خط زلزله است و هر سال چند بار زلزله میاد و مردم میترسند که فاجعه فوکوشیما یه بار دیگه در ایران تکرار بشه. Moreover, Iran lies on an earthquake fault line. As a result, Iran is subjected to several quakes every year and people fear that an incident similar to what happened in Fukushima could happen in Iran. Iran خورشید فراوانی داره ولی هم متاسفانه نیروگاه ما برای ساخت نیروگاه خورشیدی هیچ سرمایه گذاری نکرده ایران enjoys a lot of sunshine yet the government has not invested in solar power plants محور دوم اعتراضات ایران به عملکرد حکومت مربوط هست به سیاست خارجی حکومت ایران The second point of grievance of the Iranian people against the government is the government conduct on its foreign policy. And you've seen one example of that in Syria. For some two years now, the people in Syria have been fighting for democracy. Some hundred thousand people have been killed, and over a million people have been displaced. And based on a report published by the United Nations, Syria has been using chemical bombs against its own people. و در چنین شرایطی دولت ایران نیروی نظامی فرستاده پول میده از فهم میده برای کشتار مردم بیگنا And under such circumstances the Iranian government is giving Syrian government uh, money, weapons and is dispatching armed forces and military to that country اگر در بین جمعیت حاضر کسی از کشور سوریه حضور داره من به نمایندگی از مردم ایران معذرت میخواهم 
مردم ایران با سیاست های غلط حکومت موافق نیستند If anyone amongst you is from Syria on behalf of the Iranian people I would like to apologize to you for what the Iranian government is doing Iranian people are against the wrong policies of uh, Iranian government the foreign the wrong foreign policy of the Iranian government which has led to the isolation international isolation of the Iranian people is not just exclusive to Syria. Another instance is that about a year and a half ago, two uh, ships were intercepted on the Nigerian coast and it was uh, discovered that they were carrying arms from the Iranian government destined for rebels in Senegal. And since then, the Senegalese government has cut off relations with Iran. Hamjanin, dar chal mohe gozashte yek keshti aslahe ke baraye shurushiyare Yemen miraf tobe shod va mutalash sabet shod ke mutalash be dorat Iran ke baraye unha mifreste. And again, several months ago, another ship was seized. Uh, on the coast of Yemen, and uh, it, they again found arms destined for rebels in Yemen, sent by the Iranian government. The Iranian government gives itself the right to interfere in the internal affairs of other countries by sending them arms. اما به محض اینکه سایر کشورها اعتراض میکنند به نقض حقوق بشر در ایران به خاصر فرمان دولت ایران بالا میشه که چرا در امور داخلی ما دخالت میکنید yet the moment other countries object to the violation of human rights in Iran the Iranian government cries out in protest and says why are you interfering in our internal affairs از جمله دولت ایران به شدت عصبانی میشه اگر به یکی از مبارزین ما یک جایزه بین المللی مثل جایزه اونستان تنبا میده و میگه که این در حقیقت شما تشویق میکنید مردم رو این uh, The Iranian government becomes very angry when prizes such as Edelzam Prize are given to Iranian activists and they're saying, oh, you're just encouraging these activists. Whereas protesting against violation of human rights in a country is not the same as interfering in their internal affairs. And human rights is a universal standard on how life should be conducted. And whatever happens anywhere around the world is linked to everyone, all the other human beings on this earth. و به همان دلیلی که دولت ایران حق داره و می تواند راجع به نقص حقوق بشر در فلسطین و لبنان و عراق اعتراض بکنه مردم سایر دولت ها هم حق دارند در خصوص نقص حقوق بشر در ایران اعتراض کنند And just in the same way as the Iranian government allows itself to protest against the situation in Palestine, in Lebanon and in Iraq about the human rights violations in these countries, other countries in the world have equal rights to protest against violation of human rights in Iran. And do not forget that human rights is an international to 
اختلاف مردم با حکومت ایرانه نقص مستمر و سیستماتیک حقوق بشر And the third point of Iranian people's grievance against the government is the systematic and repeated violation of human rights. Mormon Mesal, Dar Iran, Tabiz, Bar Asos, Jensiyat, Bar Asos, Masnabdor. For instance, in Iran, There is discrimination on the basis of gender and on the basis of religion. بعد از انقلاب 1979 شد. After the 1979 revolution in Iran, the government adopted a series of discriminatory laws against women. در سال 1979 ما انقلاب کردیم و شاه رو که یک دیکتاتور سیاسی بود بیرون کردیم ولی کن بیرون کردن یک دیکتاتور کافی نیست. In 1979 we staged a revolution to overthrow a dictator, a political dictator who was the Shah, but it seems that overthrowing a dictator is not enough. مسئله که در بهار عراق اتفاق افتاد دیکتاتور ها رفتن ولی کن هنوز دموکراسی نمیده. And see what has happened in the Arab world, in the Arab Spring. They asked that the dictators, yet they have not attained democracies yet. And I very much hope that democracy will be attained by the Arab Spring soon. And that they will not suffer the same fate as the Iranian people. That Iran یک دیکتاتور سیاسی رفت ولی که جاش دیکتاتور مذهبی آمد که سختی تر هم بود. In Iran we asked that a political dictator but that dictator was replaced by a religious dictator who was even harsher. در سوال شو حتی هم مردم آزاد بودن که برن جهنم ولی که در این دوران حتی نمیتوانن جهنم برن ولی که دولت با زور بخواد هم رو داخل بهش بکنه. the Shah, the people at least have the right to go to hell if they wish to, but under the current government, the people cannot even choose to go to hell because the government is trying to force them all to go to heaven. Over 60% of our students in Iran are women. Iran is has 2,500 سال تمدن نوشته شده داره. Iran boasts a civilization which is over 2,500 years old. بیش از 50 سالی که زنان ایران حق رای به دست آوردن و به پارلمان رفتن، حتی قبل از زنان سوئیس. Iranian women have had the right to vote for over 50 years. That's even longer than women in Switzerland. Many of our university professors are women. And yet, Uh, under the current circumstances, since the 1979 revolution, there have been many discriminatory laws against women. <laughs> And I'm going to highlight a few of them. Based on current Iranian law, the value of a man's life is twice as much as that of a woman. And if a man and a woman are involved in an accident or in a dispute, the compensation given to the man is twice as much as that given to the woman. The testimony of two women in the court of law is equal to the testimony of one man. یه مرد میتونه چهار همسر بگیره بدون عضو موجه از هرش رو طلاق بده ولی که هم طلاق گرفتن برای زن بسیار دشوار و گاه قیل 
A man has the right to have up to four wives, and he can divorce them at any time he chooses to. Whereas uh, for a woman, it is very difficult to obtain divorce and sometimes impossible. Tebrik Bozorosh Sozomon, after the Nomelan, in the year 2012, the Iran has a lot of the world. Uh, based on Amnesty International report, it was published in 2012, after China, Iran uh, ranked the highest uh, in uh, terms of death penalty. And when we look at the demographic differences between China and Iran, and it seems like the number of execution in Iran uh, are higher than in China. Iran has the highest number of journalists and bloggers in the world. Iran has the highest number of journalists and bloggers behind bars. عجیبی وارد سیستم حقوقی ایران شد. مانند سنزار، قطع دست دوز، شلاق زدن به سریب کشیدن. After the 1979 Islamic Revolution, the variety of very strange punishments entered our penal law, such as stoning to death, cutting off people's limbs, hands and foot, flocking and even crucifixion. And that was what Bahare Hedayat was protesting against. And it is for these protests that she is now paying the price of being in prison. آزاد بشه و در اینجا بیاد و از خاطرات خودش و از مبارزات خودش با شما صحبت بکنه. I hope that one day Bahare will be freed and she be able to come and address you here and talk about her memories and her struggles to you personally. و ما نکته دیگری که مایل بودم اضافه کنم این است که علا رقم انتقالات فراوانی که ما به حکومت ایران داریم با حمله نظامی به ایران مخالفیم برای که وضعیت مردم رو بدتر بکنه Another point that I'd like to mention is that despite all our criticism of the Iranian government we are against the military attack on Iran because it will exacerbate and worsen the situation of the Iranian people و حتما می دانید که بین Iran and America are tensions that exist. And I'm sure you're well aware of the tension that exists between Iran and the United States. And ham America and ham Israel elam kardan ke hamay gozina ha az jomle jang ruy mize. And both the United States and Israel have declared that all options, including military attack, are on the table. ما با حمله نظامی به ایران مخالفیم زیرا باعث می شود که حکومت به بهانه حفظ امنیت ملی آزادی خواه رو بیشتر سرکو کنه. We are against the military attack on Iran because the Iranian government will use that as an excuse, use an issue of national security as an excuse in order to repress a freedom seekers even more. در شرایطی که تنش بین ایران و آمریکا روز به روز شدیدتر میشه به خاطر مسئله انرژی هسته ای ما اساسی کارو یک کار عجیبی کرده Meanwhile as the tension between Iran and the US is rising every day over the nuclear energy issue the Gallup Institute has done something very odd ما اساسی کارو در یک نظرسنجی که منتشر کرد اعلام کرده که اکثر مردم ایران موافق برنامه انرژی هستی هستند و 
در مورد رابطه ایران و آمریکا 60 درصد مردم ایران آمریکا رو مقصر میدونند According to an opinion poll conducted by Gallup Institute, they claim that the majority of the Iranian people are in favor of the nuclear energy program and with regards to the relations between Iran and the United States, some 60% think that it's the US that is at fault. In نظر سنجی نادرست و غیر علمیست زیرا که دولت ایران آمارگرها رو که به ایران را نمیده This opinion poll is wrong and is unscientific because for a start the Iranian government doesn't even allow uh, those who conduct polls to enter the country و ما اصاسه گروه به ایران گرده که از طریق تلفن و ایمیل این نظر سنجی رو گرفت Gallup Institute claims that it has reached this result by contacting people via telephone or email. And as you know, there is very intense censorship in Iran and all emails are monitored very closely. و همچنین تلفن ها کنترل میشه چرا که تعدادی از افرادی که در زندان هستند به خاطر کنترل تلفن بوده and also the telephones are controlled by the government and many of these uh, the activists who have ended up in prison has been because of the telephone conversations they had حالا شما فکر کنید در شرایطی که دولت ایران انقدر خشونت داره که حتی یک دختر جوان مثل باهارا رو صرفا به جرم اعتراض به نقض حقوق بشر به نقص سال حبس محکوم کرده در چنین شرایطی Now you imagine that under such circumstances when the Iranian government is so aggressive that it has sentenced a young girl Bahare to nine years imprisonment because of her protests در چنین شرایطی فکر کنید که یه نفر توی خونهش نشسته تلفن زنگ میزنه و از اون طرف تلفن کسی میگه من از آمریکا زنگ میزنم محسس گارو خواستم ببینم شما با سیاست دولت موافقید یا نه خب طبیعی است که چه جوابی که میده چیه من نمیتونه حقیقت رو بگه نه از 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 circumstances when people's calls are being monitored imagine that the Gallup Institute telephones some person in Iran and says we're calling from the United States what do you think of the situation of course the Iranian people knowing that their calls are being monitored are not going to tell the truth you have a colleague you have a lot of that circadist and businesses کامپیوتر رو باز میکنه میبینه یه ایمیل آمده و ازش میگن که ما به صورت راندوم چک داریم از شما سوال میکنیم که به نظر شما خوب با آمریکا خوبه یا نه ایران با قصر یا آمریکا فکر میکنی چه چه همون میده Or another instance, imagine a businessman goes to work, logs onto his computer and checks his emails and comes across an email from Gallup Institute saying we're doing a random check Who do you think is at fault, Iran or America? What kind of answer do you think that person is going to give? Gallup is a massive enemy, and what does that mean? Like in June, as a Sanji, enemy is. Gallup is a scientific institute, and they know very well that such conducting such opinion poll is not scientific. But why did they do that? So why has it done that? Or is the objective of the Nazar Sanji? Is there a motive behind it? و حالا به یک نظر سنجی دیگری که اخیراً باز کار رو منتشر کرده توجه کنید. And now I'm going to highlight another opinion poll recently conducted by Gallup. در نظر سنجی دوم گالوب اعلام میکنه که بیشتری دشمنان آمریکا در پاکستان و در ایران هست. On, according to this second opinion poll, Gallup has said that the greatest number of U.S. enemies are in Pakistan and Iran. In Oman, what are they trying to prove with these statistics? Avanjezi ki vezena hakas midosay nas ke hamay mardom Iran 
مثل حکومتش فکر میکنن و اگه حکومت بده بس همین مردم هم بدن The first thing that would come to people's minds would be that Iranian people must think in the same um, way as the government of Iran. So if the Iranian government is bad and wrong, so are the people. And this kind of conclusion is totally wrong. در صورتی از این بمبست سیاسی خارج میشه که حکومت به دست مردم بیفته. The Iranian people are not in favor of the Iranian government and the only way uh, that the country can emerge from this political deadlock is uh, if this government is changed. و به جای اینکه ایران رو تحریم اقتصادی بکنید که مردم انقدر صدمه ببینن و حتی در ایران دارو نایاب بشه من همواره گفتم ایران رو تحریم سیاسی کنید. So instead of imposing economic sanctions on Iran which has really had a negative impact on the people for instance there is a shortage of medicine in the country I've always said go for political sanctions instead. تحریم سیاسی شروع مختلف داره که شامل تحریم هایی است که حکومت رو تضعیف میکنه ولی کن به مردم سربه نمیزنه Now political sanctions come in different forms and they include the kind of measures that will weaken the government without harming the people از جمله ایران رو تحریم ماهواره ای کنید For instance, impose sanction on Iran's use of satellites ایران به شانزده زبان به شازد زبان غیر فارسی برنامه تلویزیونی پخش میکنه و در این برنامه ها تبلیغات دروغ به خورده مردم میده نفرت پرمکنی میکنه و این برنامه های تلویزیونی روی سطلات های اروپایی پخش میشه Iran broadcasts programs in 16 languages around the world and these televisions that are on foreign satellites and in these programs Iran spreads false propaganda and it incites hatred. اگر ایران تحریم ماهواره‌ای بشود هم سطلات‌های اروپایی و هم سایر سطلات‌های که الان به ایران خط می‌دن مثل آریاسط مثل آسیاسط و عربسط دیگه نمی‌تونن به ایران سرویس بدن. If the um, satellite sanctions is uh, imposed on Iran, the Iranian government will no longer be able to use European satellites and other satellites such as AsiaSat and ArabSat to use the, um, the satellites in order to spread this kind of hatred. لیست افرادی که مورد تحریم قرار می گیرند و به اروپا نمی توانند بیایند این را پسترش می دید. Another thing they can do is to expand the black list that has been compiled by the European Union of Iranian politicians who violated human rights. این اتحادی اروپا تعدادی از افراد رو اعلام کرده ولی کن متاسفانه خودشم عمل نمی کنه از جمله اینکه آقای نجار وزیر کشور جز لیست تحریمه ولی کن ماه قبل رفته بود اتریش در یک سمینار شرکت کرده بود چرا به اروپا راش دادیم yes the european union has compiled this list but somehow it's not respecting its own list because some of some people on the list are ministers such as the interior minister Mr. Nadjar who last month visited Austria and uh, according to the list he should have been banned from that visit yet he was not. Wazara wa nemayandegan Iran be tor daim ye Europa safar mikonand va pul hay nashi az corruption shur tu Europa Iranian ministers and representatives of the government are constantly traveling to Europe and all their money they have, uh, uh, they have uh, accumulated out of corruption are lying in European banks. 
اما وقتی که دانشجوان ما برای تحصیل میخوام بیان به اروپا هفتاد نوع اشکال برشون میش بیادیم Yet when our students want to come to Europe to study you come up with scores of various problems to stop them چند از ایرانی هایی که در سال هاست در صورت مقیم هستن به من مراجعه کردن و گفتن که خانواده شون برای دیدن فامیل شون بارها به سفارت مراجعه کردن سفارت شما سوئد در ایران اجازه ویزا به من ندادی اما وزرای ما رو را میدی و من معنای این حرف رو نمیفهمم I have been approached by several of my friends in Sweden and they have complained to me that their relatives have applied for visa to Swedish embassy in Iran, yet they have not been granted to their visas to come here and visit. I don't understand why do you allow our ministers to visit your country, yet you are not allowing ordinary citizens to do so. تعداد زیادی از ایرانی ها در سوئد زندگی می کنند و متشکرم از شما مردم سوئد که میزبان خوبی بودی و با هموطنان من به خوبی رفتار کردید. Of course I'm aware of the fact that there are many Iranians living in Sweden and I'm very grateful to the Swedish government and people for having been such generous and good hosts to them. اما الان صحبت ما سر این است که به جای تحریم اقتصادی چه کار باید بکنیم But now what we're talking about is what should be the substitute for economic sanctions تحریم اقتصادی باعث گسترش فقر در ایران شده ارزش پول ملی دو سوم ظرف یک سال کاسته شد The economic sanctions have led to an increase in the rate of poverty in the country. The value of the national currency has dropped by two-thirds in the past year. Instead of Economic sanctions or launching a military attack on Iran, please make the world a smaller place for dictators. Ba mutmain bashi ke demokrasi dar Iran ba'is aramish mantaqe ham khawat shod. And be sure that once democracy is established in Iran, the whole region will become peaceful. Mardom Iran. نمیخواهند منزوی باشند و در تعامل با مردم دنیا میخواند باشند در نتیجه سیاست های غلط حکومت رو تصیح خواهند کرد The people of Iran do not want to remain isolated from the rest of the world They want to interact with the rest of the world and therefore they stand against the wrong policies of its government دموکراسی در ایران هم برای ما خوبه و هم برای شما برای که خطر رو دور میکنه. Democracy in Iran is good for us and it's good for you because it'll ward off danger. ما همگی برای دنیایی بهتر تلاش میکنیم. We are all striving together to establish a better world. و امیدواریم که جهان را بهتر از آن چه که از پدران ما تحویل گرفتیم تحویل فرزندان ما And I hope that we will be able to pass on to our children a better world than that we inherited from our fathers and forefathers. Thank you. Thank you.
first question is, is there a limit to civic courage? How far do you think one should be prepared to risk their career, money, and lives, etc., in the defense of human rights? کار برای حقوق بشر در کشورهای غیر دموکراتیک مثل ایران راحت است. Human rights activities in non-democratic countries such as Iran is not easy. و این خطر هم شامل خود فعال و هم خانوادهش. And the danger they face also faces their families. هر کسی که به زندان میاندازند و یا اعدام میکنند خانوادهش رو تهدید میکنند که اطلاع رساری نکنه و اگر بخوان صحبت بکنند برای اونها هم ایجاد درد سر خواهد شد anyone they put in prison or execute they contact the families of these person and they intimidate them they threaten them saying if they spread any news outside the country they will be persecuted و متاسفانه اذیت آزار خانواده زندانیان سیاسی در ایران رواج زیادی دارد and unfortunately the persecution of families of political prisoners in iran is very rife The Western world is becoming more and more individualized. Do you think it is a threat to civic courage? If so, in what ways can the society prevent this from happening? Ham bale ve hamna. Baray inke. زندگی فردی الزامن به معنای خودخواهی نیست. Both yes and no because living life as individually doesn't necessarily mean being selfish. شما تکنولوژی ما رو به سمتی میبره که زندگی ها بیشتر فردی میشه. من به خاطرم میاد که زمانی که ما بچه بودیم همه آخر شب دور هم جمع شدیم که داستان هایی که قصه رادیویی رو با هم گوش کنیم و این یک نوع تفریح بود اما الان میبینید هر بچه ای یک کامپیوتر دستشه و امروز من یه چیز با مزه دیدم و صادر که می آمدم دیدم یه بچه ای شیشه شیر بود چهار سالش بود شیشه شیرش رو داشت <laughs> Technology is pushing us more and more towards individualistic lifestyles. I mean, when I think about it, when I was a child, we used to gather together around the radio and listen to stories from the radio. And that was some kind of entertainment. But these days, children are raised to... Uh, because uh, to work with technology, and technology has become their entertainment. I'll give you a funny incident that I witnessed uh, earlier today. As I was leaving my hotel, I noticed a little child, while she, he was drinking from a milk bottle, was playing on the internet. <laughs> Let me see if we have received some more questions here. In Sweden, we don't have any law or punishment against not acting if one see, sees a crime or incident to take place, compared to some other countries, for instance, France. What are your ideas regarding this? Do you think it is good if civic courage is somehow forced into law? For instance, yes, that's correct. If there is uh, someone, uh, for instance, if they see um, a fight on the street, 
they are by law uh, forced to report this to the police. And it's in Sweden we do not have this situation. طبیعتاً پیشگیری از یک حادثه و یا جرم یک وظیفه اخلاقی و بایستی قانونی در این زمینه وضع بشه که مردم رو وادار به این کار بکنه or a dispute, it must be prevented. And prevention is the best way of dealing with, with that. So yes, a country must adopt a law that could force people to report such incidents. Um, but because the issue is very serious, and I was very angry with you, I have to say that this situation has been brought to you a little bit for you. But since we are getting more and more serious, and I have told you a few bitter truths, I think it's time I told you a joke. <laughs> a man fell into a swimming pool, and he was drowning, and he was screaming, saying, I cannot swim, I cannot swim. و یه مرد دیگه یکی از اونجا رد میشد گفت اینکه فرمان زدن نداره خب منم اسکی کردم بلد نیستم another man who was passing by said to him what what are you screaming about i can't ski <laughs> دولت ایران در مجامع بین المللی و سازمان ملل همیشه ادعا کرده که دموکراتیک کشور خاورمیانه است زیرا که حداقل هر چهار سال یک بار یک انتخابات در صورت میگیرد the Iranian government has constantly said in the United Nations and international forums that its government is the most democratic government in the Middle East because at least every four years it stages elections. But elections in Iran are not free. Anyone wishing to stand as a candidate must first be vetted by the Guardian Council, and the Guardian Council disqualifies anyone it wishes. And this oversight council called the Guardian Council is made up of 12 individuals who are not elected by the people. They're appointed by the Supreme Leader. Six of them are directly appointed by him and the other six indirectly appointed by him. But at the time that this law is present and the right to vote is the right to vote, the right to vote is the right to vote. And so long as this law continues to exist and deprives people of freely choosing their required candidates, elections are meaningless. And the reason why Iran is in this current political deadlock it's because of this vetting system and because people cannot uh, choose their own the candidates they wish to choose. Thank you. So I have actually just one last question for you, Dr. Ebadi. 
and that is whether you think the current international law is sufficient enough to protect and save lives or should there be any changes in order to make it more effective. وقتی که صحبت از قوانین دنیا میکنید اون وقت از شما سوال میکنم منظورتون لیبریا توی آفریقاست یا اینکه نروژ رو میگید عربستان رو صحبت میکنید یا اینکه انگلیس رو میگید منظورتون کنون دنیاست When you speak of international laws, the laws that exist in the world, I want to know, are you talking about laws that exist in Liberia, in Africa, or laws in Norway? Are you talking about the laws that exist in Saudi Arabia or in the United Kingdom? Every country has its own domestic laws, so we have to look at every individual country and see the shortcomings and the benefits of every law they have. But I can't say that the law is not the same as the law of 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 the law. به عبارت دیگر کشورها حتی قانون اساسیشون رو بسی بر مبنای حقوق بشر تنظیم کنند. But I can say in short that human rights norms and criteria must be placed above the internal rules of every country and even the constitution of every country and each country must adapt their constitution to become uh, similar and to be in harmony with the international uh, norms and regulations. Thank you very much. Declaration of Human Rights. <laughs> um, it says, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of a person. I think it's a good thing. It's for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. 